Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to another episode of Lectures of Fallen Wisdom. Today I'm going to talk about how the overthinking mind is a really bad backseat driver, probably the worst. And this is just to inform you that though this person that is listening to this and understanding my words, this thinking mind has no real direct connection to action. The being inside of you that does have direct connection to action can hear your mind. And he understands, it understands that it, that mind is not them. It separates itself from that mind. It listens to it. But when that mind becomes overthinking, when that mind starts to spin out of control and just think like tons of thoughts, basically when it starts to stress out, when the mind that thinks, the one that can understand my words right now, when that mind stresses out, the mind that controls action gets annoyed too. It's annoying. It's annoying to have somebody in your car next to you and you're driving and they're super stressed out about your driving. And it actually can affect your performance as a driver, obviously. So as the mind, yes, you want to be thinking of all the angles and you want to be giving, of course, calling out when maybe you see something coming in the road that's particularly scary, but you don't want it to be white noise when it comes to your being. You want your being to hear something when it's really important. And you really want your being if you wanted to act in the right way, to be able to put the mind away and not listen to it and even put earplugs in if it has to, to avoid the overthinking mind, to avoid to to avoid the annoying backseat driver syndrome that goes on. Because if you are, like most people, believing that your actual mind, that your decisions that you're making with this mind are actually affecting your action. You're just in stuck in this illusion of thinking that you're not a passenger, but that you're in control. And of course, then you have to roll with that and you have to come up with all kinds of excuses for why when you've decided things, the being inside of you went a completely different direction. So, you do, And most people, they spend their whole life trying to reconcile those things. They spend their whole life trying to bridge that contradiction. It never makes sense. Nobody's ever in control of themselves as much as they want it to be. Some, most people have this illusion of control. And some people that are very disciplined, they've really convinced themselves that, well, now their backseat driver is driving. And that... that They've been able to manage to get the mind that's thinking to really influence the driver. And I think that can be done, but I just don't think it's a one-to-one relationship. I think you generally have to have some agreed-upon understandings with the being that's doing things. The being that's doing things does have an ability to think, almost on your level, if talked to by the mind. But when it's not being talked to, this being doesn't have used language. This being is not thinking in language terms or in the terms that I'm speaking now or that you're understanding these concepts. Your being in the body that does things, that being is acting according to some broad principles. Some broad principles that make sense for its survival And it also makes sense for its happiness. That's the only two things that the being really understands and wants. And all this other stuff is just fluff on the top. All these thoughts and all these yeah buts and all these very highfalutin ideas. They're not really concerning to the being that does the action. So that's why it's not always going to fall in line with your lofty spiritual goals talking to you, the mind who doesn't control action. And when it does sometimes fall in line with these lofty spiritual goals, you're happy and you're pleased with yourself. 
But when it doesn't, you feel guilty and you feel ashamed. And that's what this whole um, understanding of original sin is about. It's like almost knowing that you're, you're fallen, knowing that you can't live up to. Original sin is the fact that you can't be perfect. And that just means that the original sin is your imperfection. The original sin is your is your acknowledgement. And then coming out of the coming out of the Garden of Eden is acknowledging that you're not perfect. When in fact you are. Which is really weird because how can you Perfect compared to what? Well, if you're perfect compared to you, then you are the perfect you. But what we've done is we've taken this illusion of free will. We've taken this idea of perfect. And we've spun it into this guilt complex about not being perfect. We call that original sin. And there's this urge to get there, to become perfect. And if you're the backseat driver that wants the driver next to you that's driving, or I guess I guess you're driving from the backseat to your and she's in front of you, but you know what I mean, you could be a backseat driver in the passenger seat too. So the bottom line is if you're the driver and you're being completely influenced one hundred percent by your backseat driver how good a ride is that going to be anyway, too? It's very difficult to, if you want to live that way, you you might be able to, you might be able to at least approximate the illusion. But I I can't even, I can't even get into how you would do that. I think sometimes it just kind of falls into place. But it's still an illusion. Your being decided to go with this configuration and your mind made your mind resigned to it and your mind was just like, okay. But your being knows better about action than you do. You think you know. You're just thinking you're this incredible expert on why things happen and why you should do certain things. But actually, you know who's an expert? The thing that feels the negative emotions when they first come. And that's your being that does things. Oh, he, oh, it feels them. Not really sure what to do about it. It starts to defer to just some basic reactions when it gets involved in that kind of feeling. And you know that the being is in its most dangerous place when it's undergoing either pain, fear, or emotional disturbance, which is another form of pain. You know that the being that does things shouldn't should be that should be avoided. So when you have an overthinking mind, a mind that starts to worry, the mind that starts to think, oh well, maybe the thing that I'm thinking of that I most fear is true. When that mind starts to wig out on those facts, or on those supposed facts, or on those revelations of of horror. That is the most annoying thing to the being that does things. It is the most disrupting thing. When this mind starts to feel demoralization because there just doesn't seem to be enough time in the day to solve all these problems that the world has. There doesn't seem to be enough time in a million years to solve the problems of humanity. Those kind of thoughts, they create despair. They create a feeling in the body that your being has to undergo too. Your being has to act through that. So when your mind starts to teem with thoughts and starts to uh, feel distressed in any way, it's time to just say, okay, no more thought. Shut up, thought. The idea that You have to be constantly thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking until your mind just bursts to figure out some problem. You don't. 
You're not even going to be the one influencing the action. So you're not the one driving. So you, when you see that, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to enjoy the ride. And unless it gets incredibly topsy-turvy, I'm not going to offer my opinion. Because that's when a backseat driver is appreciated, is when you're in a real bind as a driver. But not at every turn. So I'm just starting to get an idea on how to explain this I am the passenger theory here. Because I think the ancients understood this. They had to. Because when thought started to intrude on the brain, it was a Johnny-come-lately. The human being had walked this earth for millennia with no mind, just pure being mind, just a mind that does action and no other thinking on top of it. And for some reason, and, and they some say it's because we could cook food and, and we could spend more time talking to each other, after we started being able to like master fire, the human mind started to grow this thinking apparatus on top. But it's nothing but an added feature. It's a peacock's tail on our organism. It is doing no work, except to maybe dazzle when your being mind will tap into it in a conversation here and there, except to dazzle in that way. It's not nearly in, it's not in control of anything, really. It's thinking it is and that's the great folly of the latest of human minds is that it has bought into this idea this fake idea that your thinking controls your action and has agonized over it ever since it's the it's the uh, original sin the original sin is believing this whole thing is believing that you actually have free will and that you actually are the one doing the thing that's considering these facts is the one pushing action. It isn't. There's another being in the body. And that being in the body is just needs the best possible environment to act in. It's like a, it's like a baby. You don't want a baby to be subjected to things. You want it to grow up strong without having too much adversity. And you got to treat your doer that does things like a little toddler that's walking around like okay you want to make sure it doesn't bump into things and perhaps you can shout some advice over and perhaps it will listen there's no guarantee but you want to do it in the most key moments because that's when the being sometimes is at a loss the being that does things will access your files will access what's in your mind just for that moment and that's where this new peacock feather has come in handy in, in many ways. There's something here, but it wants to take over. It wants to be the whole that is you, and that's just not going to be a good idea. Even if it were possible, it, it wouldn't happen. The thing that we've done is we've convinced even the being that the mind is in control. So sometimes the being can't separate. But if you can separate it as the thinking mind, the being will follow suit. The being will separate it. The being that does things will stop listening so much to you as a backseat driver. And that's what happens when you have a backseat driver in your car. If you keep getting angry at it, then it's just going to even be worse. So you need to find a way to get into it to even enjoy the backseat driving. If you're the being. And sometimes that can seduce you in some way, maybe to listen on, at times to it. For the most part, though, it just messes you up. Sometimes the thinking mind is very manipulative. And it wants the being in the body that does things to feel sad and to, to act accordingly. So maybe if it pours sadness into your organism, this thing will do the right thing. This being that does things. It's very man we're very manipulative like that. Deep down, we know we have no control. So we try to 
work ourselves in, up into false emotions to push to to influence the being that's doing the action. And that's another that just but you realize that's manipulative. It's manipulative behavior on the part of the mind that is frustrated that it doesn't have control. It's what a prisoner in the body would do. And we are prisoners in our own body. We are prisoners under but we are also prisoners of the the environment mind that we create. And that's the only thing that this thinking mind has power to do. This thinking mind has the power to create an atmosphere of pleasure so that the being that does things can act with that on instead of some negative emotion or some some lost sense of uh, fear or something that just doesn't doesn't sit right. Uneasiness, awkwardness. All these emotions, they're poison in the body. They're there to just guide you, but they're not there to be dwelled upon. Just like you, a flame, they're they're like um, putting some, your, your finger onto a flame. Like you don't need to do it for an extended period of time. It just needs to burn you once or twice to know you don't want to feel it anymore. But we haven't ma- we've mastered how not to burn ourselves with fire. We just we keep our hands away. But we we have not mastered how to stop burning ourselves with negative emotions. That's the thing that really we ever since we got this new feather, this new peacock that helps us get chicks, but also helps us think our way into depression. This thing has just never figured out how to stop your being from walking into flames. I think just through enough time, your being has just figured it out with fire. But emotions are much more complex, and they change with the changing times. And you get taught how to – you get taught what to get upset about, and you get taught what to take seriously – it's all taught to you. It's all taught to you, and it's there's there's an emotional blackmail going on when it comes to all societal values and emotions because they're trying to keep you in check. They're trying to keep you on some kind of order, and they're they're using emotional manipulation to do this. And who's this day? Who's doing this? Well, the other beings. They they act in concert unconsciously, obviously, and. If you're pumping fear, if we're all pumping fear, right, pumping fear into our bodies, yes, then we will become the Hobbesian universe. The Hobbesian universe is, talking about John Hobbes, life is nasty, brutish, and short. That will become true if everybody's awash in fear. But if everyone's awash in pleasure, then you will be in what I will start to call the circle of serenity. And the circle of serenity is very powerful. Like if you can get a lot of people into that circle, the circle of I'm a passenger in the body. I'm here to make the the I'm here to make the body feel good so that the doer that does things feels good while it's doing them and that's all I can do that I can't control action that free will is a lie that all this overthinking is just like a shitty backseat driver and is not helping even if the driver doesn't know what it's doing that the being that does things finds its way Mostly for you, the mind being silent and just offering advice when it's very important. You know, you're not doing, you're not, your your being is not pulling out its calculator, your mind, to do two plus two equals four. And to do other pretty high level computations. There's a certain amount of automatic stuff going on in the being that does your being that does things 
and you're only disrupting it by filling it with the chattering of your of your um, talk, the chattering of what's going on in this part of the mind, the one that's hearing this. When you're distracting it with that, when you're trying to like get its attention through pumping negative emotions into the body, through thoughts that you have, through memories, well, guess what? You're doing that a lot, and you realize how effective that is, and you see that it actually does pour negative emotions into your body. So you see that if you just did the exact opposite and you started talking about or thinking about good things, things that were that happened to you that were great and that were fun, that you can pour those emotions into your body. So maybe that was the whole purpose of feeling that pain. It was the whole purpose of learning to use it, to flip it on itself. Because what emotional pain shows you is that your emotional pain will conjure up a thought to try to justify what it is. And that thought can then, when thought of, bring back the pain. It's like almost like a a mnemonic device. So when you have the the thought, the pain comes back. So when you have a good thought, then the, the good feeling comes back. Maybe you would never have learned that. Unless it, the pain really, you know, you, you, it was so easy to see. Like when you have a thought about some past event, all the pain comes back. A painful past event. And you see that. And you see how manip, how, how it can change everything that happens with that organism. That's how you can influence yourself. Like you've been influencing yourself through negative emotions. By shaming, by shaming, but because you, you are, you've convinced your being that does things and you, yourself, that the mind is in control and that should be ashamed for why it falls short of what the mind considers to be perfect. Now, the mind is set up, and more in the Western society than it ever is, it's set up to... To analyze everything from the position of the perfect and then degrade it accordingly. And it's something that has probably not, it hasn't been necessary for this peacock feather to do. And, and there's probably examples of this peacock feather that doesn't do these things. But in the West, we've created, we've we've managed to hone these peacock feathers so that they make us eternally feel falling short of or feeling that like ashamed of the fact that they have not reached perfection which is impossible that's the paradox perfection is impossible and yet we all feel ashamed that we're not there And we all criticize others for not being there. And that's our main criticism. It's like the one thing about the guy is he talks too much. Basically what you're saying is – hold on. Basically what you're saying is he's not perfect. That's your criticism. Like when people do these evaluations and work, they give you their – and they, they they put one thing that's not so great about you, you know. Eh, maybe you should maybe you shouldn't do this. And so that's that's how it works. And then you'll you'll get the criticism and then you'll have to, you know, move on with it. But the idea is that we're always evaluating each other and we're always evaluating others as not perfect. And criticizing people for it. And then when it's really bad, then you're just off the charts not perfect. And that's just unacceptable. But everybody's either annoying or an asshole. 
in most people's eyes. Everybody's either, there's something wrong with everybody in the minds of the Western human. And there's something wrong with itself, too, in the mind of the Western human. And that's it. That's the gulf, that, that paradox, that feeling of emptiness, that feeling that of, of, of actually being ashamed that we'll never reach the potential of perfection. That feeling is a driver of a very kind of action, a very ego-centered type of action, a very selfish, grubby, petty form of action that when you look upon it from your very lofty mind is very shameful to look at. It's very just like, ugh, God, what a, what a small individual. And that disgust then all washes into your organism. And then that's just, it's no good. So a wash your organism in the right kinds of emotions. That's all you can actually do. Unless, unless you want to be a backseat driver, unless you want to be like this annoying backseat driver that that can actually sometimes distract the being that does things and make it get into a crash, but certainly not driving. So I think we can move on there, but it's important to realize it. Because the guilt is one of the main, the guilt and the shame and the, the regret, the sadness, all that stuff is just it's it's like you're slapping your driver in the face while it's driving. That's all you're doing. No no, I mean maybe he deserves it, but wait till he stops driving. And even then. Maybe that's what sleep is for, is so that like you guys can battle it out. The two minds. But during the day when you're walking around, the overthinking mind should be shut off. And just for this reason. Anyway, thanks for listening. This is Lectures of Fallen Wisdom. <laughs>